I will transition now to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, and I have notes for that too. Donald Kosman is director of the Microsoft Research Lab here in Redmond. Uh, and as, as such, uh, is, a, is a position of great responsibility. Um, and in be besides directing a lab that does research in all fields of computer science, he does his research on his own. And uh, that focuses on data management in the cloud and uh, the challenges about making it cheaper, more valuable, and secure. Uh, he has a lot of the distinguished accomplishments under his belt. I'll just mention a couple. Uh, he's an ACM fellow, and he's been for about four years chair of the ACM SIGMOD uh, uh, interest group. Uh, but the one that really called my attention is that over the summer, he has devoted himself to write a, uh, a book uh, about computer science for teenagers, although it's in German, so I haven't, haven't had a chance to really parse it completely. I know it's about computer science because he has arrows and boxes, so you know it's computer science because he has those things in it. Um, but uh, I will let her, I will let him, him uh, uh, talk more about his work and himself. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Donald Kosman. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll just get my presentation started. So thanks, uh, Gonzo, for giving my elevator pitch. I was already sweating and said, oh, I have to give an elevator pitch. But essentially, I am going to give an elevator pitch. Um, but there's some things uh, for the book just before, while I'm setting up. I have four children, um, among others, three teenage daughters. And they kept on asking me on why did I do computer science? And that was actually a pretty tough question for me to answer. And I found out that I actually never answered that question. Um, while, so actually, to, 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 to take a step back, um, I joined Microsoft five years ago. And before that, I was uh, uh, on the faculty of ETH Zurich for 15 years. Um, so this is my second life, my second career. And uh, so at some point, I found out that I had no good answer. So I kind of went through a whole professor career um, without answering the question, why is computer science something that, uh, why was I fortunate to or lucky to study computer science? So that's what this book is about. Um, what I will talk about a little bit, so I actually I want to just do an elevator pitch. I'll talk for about 20 minutes and then open it up. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my perspective, what I think is the next uh, frontier or the next generation, the next era of computing. Um, and, uh, but this is my personal view. As uh, Gonzo said, this lab does everything. And I don't really hear, I don't really prescribe and say, well, this is, we should all be working on the, on the global AI supercomputer. This is not how MSR works. MSR is bottom up and uh, everybody creates their own vision. And this is my personal vision and I don't, um, mandate anybody to share it, but just the way I, how I think about it. But before I do that, I want to give you a little bit of, a, of an overview of Microsoft Research. Um, so this is kind of like Microsoft Research in one slide. Um, it's about 1,000 people. Pretty A little more than a third is here in Redmond, and the rest is gathered all around the world. So this is by far the biggest site. Um, if you think about these thousand people, it's two thirds are researchers and think of a researcher as a professor. That's pretty much how we think of uh, researchers and that's also how we, um, how we kind of evaluate them in, in, in some sense. But they are free, but they also, we, we believe they all are, could be professors in top universities uh, around the world. And uh, they have all the freedom, they have uh, a research agenda. The difference is they collaborate maybe more than at least I was used to in, uh, in the, um, in, in when I was in academia. Uh, ETH, I don't know whether you know ETH, has, um, has, uh, has fairly large groups, so every professor has their small little fiefdom. Um, here, this is very collaborative because we don't have as many students. We do have students, and we're very fortunate that you're coming here today, but of course we have also the internship program. But mostly we do our work in collaboration between researchers, but also we have engineers, designers, program managers, because we also build stuff. And uh, the big difference uh, between MSR or industry research and academia is that we don't really think in lockstep of what a PhD thesis is. We try to think, uh, 
bigger or sometimes also smaller, uh, but we really don't need to think about PhD-sized uh, contributions, uh, thesis-sized contributions. We can go much bigger or also smaller if that is uh, fun and, and makes sense. But we also build things. And we really, our kind of, uh, our mission essentially is, uh, uh, I'll, I'll come to that a little bit, but uh, is really to make the world a better place, right? It's not... Our focus is not in educating people, although we, we do that as well, but and grow people. And uh, I think this is a marvelous place to learn and, and do things. I'm learning definitely a lot, but uh, the focus is really to make the world a better place. Um, we are very, very open and engaged with the academic community. I think uh, many of the conferences where you go, you will find Microsoft is a sponsor. And you will also find, if it is a sponsor, many of our People will be there and you can interact with them. And uh, one of the great things that we do is we, we can talk and we can do and, uh, with everybody. Uh, we're totally free and open, whereas product groups at Microsoft, sometimes uh, um, they have confidentiality and all that. We don't have that. And they don't uh, talk to their competitors. We, we work freely with Google, with uh, Facebook, with everybody. Okay, just to um, um, give you another kind of perspective, that's, we're pretty proud of this. Um, so if you think about 650 professors, that's a pretty serious university. Um, and so you could also assume that we, uh, we do have some uh, credentials, right? So we have five Turing Award winners, which is, um, ETH, for example, has only one. Of course, they don't have 650 professors. So yeah, actually, in the ratio, we are doing worse than ETH. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, but uh, yeah, well, let me not go further on that one. <laughs> OK, so w what we do is essentially three, our mission are three things. Um, actually, I'm not sure how interesting this is, but I often give this kind of presentation also to customers, so because they they want to understand uh, uh, what Microsoft, why is Microsoft doing this, and uh, there's a there's a good reason uh, there's good reason why this is good for the company, and this is why I'm not worried that Microsoft research is going to disappear anytime soon. Um, at this point, Microsoft is all about innovation. Uh, our CEO said that kind of one of the first things he said was uh, this industry doesn't value uh, or respect uh, tradition. It only respects innovation. And so we are a big, big part of the innovation of the, uh, of the company. And so the, the way the company thinks about it is it's not that there's this group and uh, think tank also and press uh, innovation. I think the, the big reason why you're also here is this part. In order to kind of distill the in innovation or get something that changes the world, we really have to engage in the scientific community and do thinking and think about things in the world and about science in a way that is totally unconstrained and has nothing to do with the company. So when we talk about the advancing the state of the art in computer science, this is exactly the academic research that has no ties and no kind of um, uh, constraints in the same way as you would call academic research. Now, academia has other responsibilities and accountabilities in writing grants. We, we don't have to write grant proposals. All, the, all that is, comes naturally and just flows to us and does teaching. We don't do that. But then we have to do other things, of course, as well. And that is, w once we have something, we do really want to get it uh, out into, into the real world. And that's what uh, this part is about, rapidly transferring innovation. So when we have something, we will engage with product groups, with open source community, whatever, with the scientific community, with whatever makes sense to advance uh, um, uh, not only the state of the art, but actually make it real. And that's why we also, we build stuff a lot. And then... Uh, and again, of course, the company hopes that uh, quite a bit of that uh, will, will lead to things in the company and, uh, and we, we have a great track record. Many parts of Azure would not be possible without research though. Yeah, we were talking about networking, all of the networking, all the leaders, they were used to be researchers uh, um, in, in Microsoft Research. Uh, Bing is another example where kind of the company never really believed in search until 
they really had to. <laughs> they had no choice into believing it, and then they started Bing, and they could do that because Microsoft Research there. Kinect is another uh, great example. And then one of the things, and is uh, um, incubating disruptive, it's kind of, kind of there's a there's controversy between uh, there's a re redesign of that. Sometimes we also talk about. Uh, securing the vibrancy and future of the company. But one way you could also interpret that is we, we kind of uh, take care of, of people and, uh, and uh, try to grow them to do, become innovators and entrepreneurs. And of course, we are also uh, responsible for attracting and hiring great talent. And this is usually the, the third pillar. Okay, I'm going to... Um, um, I'm going to I'm going to go a little bit faster, but one of the things that we do, I mean, I've, I've I have slides on how we kind of um, um, create value to the company, but then I usually animate it. And one one way I I put it, how the company looks at us. So if I run into Satya, our CEO, on the hallway, he will always the the, the thing that he will ask me, he will say, Donald, what is new? And I think this is. Uh, I thought so. He does that really. This is this is true, and I always thought about that. Is this because it's kind of like, oh yeah, do I have something new or not? Um, but actually, this is something really positive, um, because he asked that because he expects something new, which means he is excited about getting something new, and plus he is kind of confident that we keep on producing something new. And so the the one way to put Microsoft Research is. Our job is essentially to create surprises. And our leadership wants to be surprised. And it's just, uh, I think it's really, really nice to work for a company and uh, where the leadership wants to be surprised. Uh, because sometimes managers, they don't want to be surprised, right? They just want to do their business as usual and every kind of disruption is bad. So what I want to talk a little bit about for the next 10 minutes is, um, um, is why these are the golden days of Microsoft Research. And I think uh, you're fairly... So throughout my career, and I have now a longer career, I've been around, this slide has been kind of... You could have, at every point in time, you could have shown this slide. Right? Um, it just has gotten better and better. But it has actually become an kind of exponentially better and better. Um, the world is becoming digital was true 25 years ago, but now we're kind of we're breaking some of the, 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 the frontiers and the world is reinventing itself. So what I'm going to talk a little bit about is what I think is going to be the next generation of computing. So for those, I don't know whether you've think, thought about the history of computing, but it has been a little bit like a pendulum. Um, we have had five generations of computing. It started like with the main frame or the, uh, the big machines that you know from uh, the Manhattan Project, which essentially did m number crunching, scientific computing, um, airline reservation, and so on, very centralized computing. The second generation was kind of from a very centralized to distributed, uh, was the PC area. And the PC era, essentially, what was the killer application of the PC era? Hmm? Pardon? Spreadsheets. Spreadsheets, yeah. Productivity, yeah. Spreadsheets is good. Uh, World Wide Web is actually the third one. So sp spreadsheets, Word, PowerPoint, but actually, just name it, uh, games, right? Gaming was, uh, that's, what's, that's why Microsoft still is in the gaming thing. You, can, you cannot play games on a mainframe computer. Yeah, I, 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 I programmed a mainframe computer, so you typed in your thing, and then you came back the next day uh, to get the printout of your results, usually a stack dump, right? Um, but uh, with a PC, and it, uh, gaming is not very fun in this environment, because you make a shot, you come back next day and said miss, right? <laughs> That's not how you play games. Uh, the next, so that was very um, distributed, right? Every PC, everybody plays their game, of course, for themselves. Then came the, the web, essentially. Um, that is, again, a very centralized architecture. And what, was the, what is the killer app of the, the web? Email. Email, yeah. I, I, I don't think email is the, but I'll put it more generally. It's a, so 
social networks and sharing of data. Yeah? So if you have a PC, sharing data is actually, yeah, that's, yeah, you need to do email, but email is very clumsy in sharing data. It's, it's good to kind of do a message, but if you, the World Wide Web came uh, across because you wanted to share scientific documents, that's how Tim Berners-Lee invented it. Okay, so the next wave is the smartphone, obviously, again, in the decentralized way, and, um, um, and uh, the, 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 the killer app of that, obviously, is Google Maps, uh, sense health, uh, the wellness applications, everything that you do kind of suddenly, uh, you digitalize your, your kind of, your world, right? You start digitizing the world. The, the, the iPhone, what is really great, or the smartphone, what is really great about it, it, it has sensors. It gets, an, and now watches and so on. They all sense the world. Okay, then uh, the next generation is the cloud, obviously. What is the killer application of the cloud? Virtualization is not the killer application, that's the technology that drives the cloud. But the application why people are so doing this in the cloud is, is AI. Because again, it's a central architecture. It is bringing all the data into the cloud. It has massive uh, amounts of computing resources in the cloud to learn models and, and do that. So I just wanna uh, go how I think about kind of where we're gonna go next. So again, this is, uh, uh, this is maybe the slide. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this statement, which again has been true for the last 70 years. Um, your next computer is a supercomputer, but I'm going to give it with a, with a special twist. So, um, so I, I said this pendulum, but throughout this pendulum, um, there have been two curves that have been totally steady. And you could have drawn them in any kind of time scale, and they would have all looked the same. And you can, can probably or maybe continue to draw them. So the size of a computer over history always was, became smaller and smaller. And the number of machines, there's this famous quote of uh, T.J. Watson in 1960, I think. He said, there's a worldwide market for three computers. Right? There's these uh, very funny misquotes, right? <laughs> mispredictions. Bill Gates also had a very funny one. Does it, uh, does, do people know what Bill Gates predicted? which was really, really dumb. He predicted uh, that computers would never have more than 64 kilobytes of main memory. Yeah? That uh, didn't happen, right? Uh, so anyway, the number grew obviously beyond three. Uh, Watson was wrong, and uh, IBM actually did fairly well nevertheless, but uh, at some point uh, they did. So what I'm going to argue, and this is, uh, uh, and this is what I, I want to kind of tell you, that. Of course, you can go down, down, and up, up. But I think we should start thinking for the next kind of maybe generation of distributed computing. We should think about that the world is, has exactly one machine. Yeah? In the same way as a, car, as a PC today or a smartphone is not many machines. It has many processors. It has many storage units. It has many network interfaces. Right? It has an Ethernet, a wireless, Bluetooth. We think of a PC as one computer. We think of a car as one computer. Yeah? A car, does anybody know how many computers you would kind of, as a, as a mechanical engineer, a BMW, do you, does anybody have a, how many processors a, a, a BMW has? Anybody know? Anybody has a guess? It's about 200 processors. 200. 200 processors, yeah? And of course, some engineers think about it as to each processor, kind of the processor that is the NAV system, the processor that controls the injection of, uh, of, uh, of gasoline into the engine and so on. Those are all individual computers that are programmed. But for us, really, it is one single big computer and it's one big machine. And what I'm going to argue is, and this is the way I'm kind of thinking about, um, about research in computer science is, well, let's think about this world as one computer. And, uh, and that is uh, uh, essentially what, uh, um, I mean, I'm not gonna go through the whole talk, but th this is a, a, essentially what I want to, um, want to, what to what I wanna drive home. So when you think about this 
this world, you can, you can have it as one, as an internal perspective, is what we as researchers mostly have been doing, like billions of small devices and computers. But most people like, uh, will think of this, and this is what I call the external perspective, as one computer. And they will want to program it, they will want to optimize it, and they will want to secure it as one big machine. And, um, um, and of course, both perspectives are important. As a database researcher, I mostly have this internal perspective. As uh, every of these kind of machines, I need to somehow program. I need to make sure that it gets the data that it needs. But I, I'm forcing myself to also have the perspective of, of most of our customers who don't really care, and this is maybe the virtualization aspect, where data lies. They just want it to work. If I am a, um, um, so uh, Mary is an HCI researcher, right? At the moment when I program for HCI, let's say uh, for, uh, I would program, a, I have a new idea of an app. I would program the smartphone app. But really, as a, as a user, Yes, maybe I'll use the smartphone app and I'm looking at my smartphone all day, but really what I care about is the experience that I get. And that should be really decoupled from the smartphone app. Yeah? So it should be, if I'm looking at my smartphone app, I want the experience, my information to be on the screen of the smartphone app. But when I watch TV, I want the experience to be kind of moved from the smartphone app to the TV. And this, these are all kind of patterns um, that, um, that, um, 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 that, that kind of, uh, that I think that can help us to innovate in this area by thinking, rather by thinking uh, device by device or, or sensor by sensor or microcontroller by microcontroller or network link by network link, if we think about the whole world as a computer and we want to change it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop pretty, pretty much here, but I'm going to give a little bit of overview um, on, on the, the areas that I kind of care about. And Gonzo already said, we want to make this more valuable. We want to make it sustainable. We want to secure it. But essentially, I, I have examples. And to the, the way I think about projects in the lab is thinking about examples. So, if you think about this is the new next generation computer, then of course I want, I, I want to think about what is the killer app of this computer. Yeah? So in the same way as we had a killer app for the mainframe, a killer app for the PC, a killer app for the web, a killer app for the smartphone, a killer app for the cloud, I want to know what can you do if you take this approach and if you believe that we are going into that age, what can you do with this computer mostly in the good sense, that you couldn't do before. Yeah? So I, I was mentioning gaming you can do with a PC, you cannot do with a, with a, uh, with a, with a, um, with a mainframe. And there are examples. We've uh, kind of, uh, one example that I really like to give is uh, precision agriculture. Um, it's a very known technology. It's kind of, most of you will have heard of precision medicine, right? Where you kind of, uh, well, if you have a, if you have a cough uh, in the old days, well, this is what you got, right? Everybody got the same. And now with precision medicine means you kind of uh, target your, your therapy, but also your diagnostics to the, to the individual person or personalized medicine. You can do the same thing for agriculture. How much water, what, do you, what plants do you grow on a special field? How much water do you give? How many pesticides and so on? The problem with precision agriculture traditionally has been that you don't know what's going on in the field. What can you do with this uh, global AI supercomputer? You kind of fly, because the sensors that uh, tell you which bugs, for example, live on the field are very expensive. What do we do now? We fly, we have a drone that flies over it, takes pictures of the field, um, and then uses Neil's wonderful uh, digital photography uh, ideas um, to kind of make sense what's going on on the field. That's a very cheap sensor. The, se the sensors that really count bugs are still expensive, but a camera that takes pictures is of course not as precise, but now we can do that. 
Of course, we also care about the negative things that you can do with such a computer. Um, and that's why ethics is such an important um, um, topic for us. Uh, when I started computer science uh, and I wrote grant proposals, I never had to go through an ethical review. Today, computer science, you do whatever you want to uh, what you do, do the smallest thing. Every computer scientist needs to go, uh, who writes a grant proposal, needs to go at least a little bit through ethical reviews because of that, because you can also create negative value with your technology. The second, this is the one that I'm mostly concerned about, is how do we make it sustainable, the world? And I'm, I'm kind of have the big talk in how, um, uh, what is an efficient machine, and if you now think of the world as a whole as an efficient machine, uh, that we have to really completely rethink computing uh, in order to do that. In particular, my community is famous for doing something, optimizing for something that's called bare metal performance. If you have any systems person here, they will agree bare metal performance. That's what we want to achieve. Um, and I think uh, what we need to uh, optimize better for is a, a, is a good utilization of the resources. And at the moment, we're clearly doing a very poor job of that. The third thing is security um, that we care a lot about and I care a lot about. Um, so if the whole world is connected, if this is one big machine, within a car, you kind of don't do much isolation because the car, BMW, has manufactured the car as one kind of monolith for you and the security is kind of as one monolith. But the world is clearly not one monolith and so uh, you somehow need to worry and care about security, confidentiality, fake news, um, which is integrity, um, um, the reliability in a, um, in a very different way. And the way I put it, drawing lines and uh, in, um, in, in a world, uh, uh, drawing lines in a world that is hyper-connected. And the last one is the human aspect, of course, how, how will people interact with this machine? So with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close because this is a little bit of an overview um, of how I personally think about the, 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 the questions that we as researchers, if we kind of go and want to answer and help solve the big problems of the world, these are the questions that uh, I believe or that I ask myself in every day in the things that I do. Okay, and then I ran a little bit over longer than I wanted to. I wanted to only 20, but now it's rather 25 minutes and really want to open it up for questions. I want to hear actually from you what you care about and what motivates you and drives you in doing, um, in doing your research. Okay, thanks. And yeah. I'm gonna... Yeah. So at the end, what was the answer you gave your daughter? <laughs> yeah, so, <clears throat> um, so it's a hundred page answer. Oh. It was supposed to be, and it got longer and longer. It, I, the, 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 the criterion was that it was supposed to be readable in one afternoon, which is kind of barely uh, doable. Um, actually, now my daughters say they don't read anymore. They, they want to watch YouTube videos, so I, have to, I might have to re go back to the drawing board. So. My, my, um, my, my answer essentially is, um, is, um, is that um, yeah, it's a, I, now I have to kind of condense it down. So, so I'm an engineer. That's the one first answer. I want to kind of build stuff. And, um, and I, I think the, what computer science, or what is, was great for me in computer science is, that I could easily build stuff without kind of too much ado. That is really what made computer science for me attractive. Now, of course, the answer is a little bit more nuanced and I gave a little bit more, but uh, this is essentially what it boiled down to. And then the, the other thing that I, um, that I point out is that how computer science is reinventing itself. And I think at the moment with the, uh, with I think with also what I've talked about here, it's reinventing itself again. And it's reinventing itself doesn't mean we're creating new methodologies. Like AI might be a new methodology. What I think is we're reinventing ourselves by creating new goals. So if you think about mathematics, 
the, I mean, and if you think about good or what mathematics was about is creating a perfect number theory, right? Or physics was always about uh, understanding the world. And it has always been that, right? And maybe relativity theory gave some insights in how to explain the world, but the goal always has been the same. And in computer science, the goal has changed all the time. And that I, and, and that I think is pretty cool, right? And that's why you can have multiple careers in computer science. Yeah? So I'd like to dispute. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I'd like to dispute the part about value. You say that the innovation lies in doing things you could not do before. But it seems more like computing, a lot of the value of computing is not having to do things that you had to do before. So you can think back to the computer before uh, machines were people, right? Crunching numbers. Mm -hmm. Now we don't have to crunch numbers, or we don't have to crunch numbers, but number crunching still happens, right? So why would I want to create something that I can, that lets me do something without first defining what I am trying not to do anymore? Yeah, so I, I think automating things is, uh, is something that, you, I mean, if you can automate things that you couldn't automate before, that is doing something that you couldn't do before. I, I think maybe we're, this is kind of uh, tweaking uh, words here a little bit. Um, but I, I do think that we, um, we are getting, and this is why I was mentioning the, the precision agriculture or, or personalized medicine. Those are things that we really couldn't do before. Maybe we could do them conceptually, but pragmatically, practically, we couldn't do them before. And uh, so I, I do think there are, it is worth thinking about things that either, I mean, pr in principle, of course, you can do everything, and, uh, uh, but um, that, that, that are game changing just by this aspect, right? There was a reason why you didn't do it before, and now you can do it, and they make the world a better place. But let's not kind of tweak the, the words too much, right? I mean, ultimately, what, what we want to achieve here is make the world a better place, right? So that's the very uh, simple, high-level, undisputable kind of thing. But, uh, but this is one way to think about it, maybe. Yeah? And everybody has to find their own formulation. So I'm just wondering, what exactly drives the projects that Microsoft Research uh, does? Is that product areas at the greater company, or just like great ideas that you guys come up with? So what, are, what drives projects at Microsoft Research? Yes, yeah, so we are a bottom-up organization. So the, the researchers, the people, people like Mary, Gonzo, Neil, but there are, as I said, hundreds of those, they, they drive. Yeah, they drive. So we are totally disconnected in the sense that uh, uh, product groups don't tell us what to do. Yeah, and that's very, very important because otherwise we couldn't, uh, uh, you, I, th I hope you all know about inventor's dilemma, right? Uh, so that protects the company from inventor's dilemma. So the, the, it's the ideas, the passion, um, but it is not only the idea in the, okay, I'm gonna write a great paper about this. It should be an idea, it's a great paper, it's great science, because that, otherwise other, others could probably do it as well. But it is kind of, it has impact in the, in the sense it's gonna make the world a better place. Yeah? Hi, I think I actually have more of like a comment. Um, but I, when I think about like the future of computing, I think about um, one of my favorite talks by Kamal Bob who talks about how our societies and our cities are becoming like technopolises. And mm -hmm. essentially, to be a functioning citizen, you have to have some type of digital or computational literacy. And so I think if we're gonna think about the future of computing, we also have to understand the ways that we're fundamentally changing, what does it mean to be a citizen, the ways that we're creating these types of inequities and systems of oppression too. Yeah, I think this, I think this belongs into this, this is why I put it this way, how to say what you want. As a citizen, of course, um, and, and this is where it's kind of, yeah, it it's kind of goes both ways, right? Essentially, you want to say what you want, and then the, the, 
the machine should understand. But as, uh, as you said, so for example, Tokyo is going to have 50 mil million people by 2035 or something like that, or 40. Um, that will completely change how logistics happen in those cities completely independent of computing, right? You'll have to essentially flood with food the city and then people take what they can get. Rather, the, the drive to the mall is going to disappear. And also the kind of uh, ordering uh, on Amazon might be very different in the, those worlds because you, the logistics are otherwise just going to work, not going to work because of density. So people will have to adjust as well. Um, and, and I completely agree with that. Yeah. Uh, so I think you gave us a preview in, during your talk, but what do you miss the most and the least of being a university professor? Um, I, 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 it's really hard to answer that question. Um, so I loved being a university professor. I, I loved every aspect of it. Um, at some point, I think uh, when you get uh, fairly senior, the things that happen is the overhead, the administrative overhead as a university professor gets pretty high. Um, you suddenly pulled into any kind of strategic uh, uh, com committee and whatever. Um, and that kind of gets, uh, gets you. But to be honest, I loved the job. And I had just seen it. And now it's a completely new job. Um, it's very different. And in, 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 it's very similar in some aspects. The research at the end is very similar. I mean, the way I think hasn't changed. My, let's say, research taste hasn't changed and shouldn't change. Um, but the, the way I work with colleagues versus with students has changed. Here I work with colleagues. At the university, I work with students. Both are great. I've had it actually more than 15 years, because of before I was at ETH, I was already at Technical University of Munich and Heidelberg and so on. Um, so I had it for 20 years. Um, I've seen it. I'm now moving on. So I don't. It's not that I'm missing it. Um, I loved it, but uh, it was a different world, and I've, I had 20 years of that, right? And uh, now I'm in year five of what I have now. <laughs> yeah? Hi, thank you for, for that. That was great. Um, my question is building off of what she asked, and it's more about data integrity in developing regions of the world. So in the US, there's this whole thing about fake news, and you know, everyone is used to it. Um, in developing contexts, the, the idea of fake news becomes even more problematic. So yeah. it's easier for people to forward messages on WhatsApp. It's harder to check if those messages are, are truthful <coughs> messages, especially if there's like end-to-end -end encryption. Yeah. And with more and more AI tools, you know, computer becoming better, it's going to become much easier for people to create these contents faster. Yeah. So in the US, the computer, computer scientists, it's easier for us to be able to see, oh, maybe this is something from deep fake. Mm -hmm. But in developing regions, it's like whatever is online, it's true. How do, you, how do you balance that? Like, How do you help these people see that without being completely paternalistic? Yeah, I, I wish I had, this is a great comment, amazing comment. Um, I wish I had an answer. I mean, the, the, what I'm putting here is not answers. I'm, what I'm saying here, those are questions. Um, I don't, I think this is a, I, yeah, I haven't, I haven't thought about that particular answer, uh, angle specifically because, um, but I think these are, these are great questions. And I, and I would love to encourage you to work on these questions. I mean, if, it's, it's you who will, who will fix these questions. I mean, I'm, I, feel, I, I feel a little bit, I'm, I still feel that I'm in, in the business, but uh, I, I also feel responsible for quite a bit of the mess uh, th that is created here. And this, I think, is one of the big messes that we've created and uh, that we have to clean up. So my kind of, let's put it, my generation is, uh, uh, um, we are thinking about solving some of these. And I, I think I, I love the clarity of the question that you have. I'll, that will impact me. Um, um, mostly on the, so again, you have, to, you have to understand that I grew up very 
technology centric. And uh, some of these questions will have to be kind of uh, addressed in a, in a much broader context. Um, not, it's not going to be only technology as you kind of hinted at. There's a, a lot of social aspect, uh, human uh, factor aspect. And, um, and I think this is where you're, hopefully your generation is going to be much better than my generation, let's put it that way, uh, because I've been very, very technology focused and I hinted at it a little bit with the ethics. This is something totally new for me, something that I have to learn and you're probably native in, in, in that. And, and I think you're in a much better position to solve this. And I really want to, would like to encourage you to think about these things. Um, so similar kind of question. So um, I think that if we look at other aspects of society, like education, the legal system, yeah. policy, which are still kind of trying to catch up with internet, with mobile computing, mm -hmm. um, how kind of does Microsoft Research think about working with those other aspects of society to kind of ensure that when we go to this next supercomputer yeah. in the research sense that we can actually transition in a societal sense? Yeah. So. Um Actually, I think Microsoft is uh, is doing is doing extremely uh, not extremely well there, but is doing kind of is trying to get there. So our president Brad Smith is really really active in that. So he goes to universities. He thinks about uh, um, uh, he's a lawyer, right? So he thinks about law enforcement. Um, I think uh, he also encouraged us, and uh, this, uh, we have this ether committee, which is like ethics, and mostly in AI, uh, which actually spun out of Microsoft research, has been very, very, uh, so the leadership, like Brad Smith, has been very supportive. I think we've been kind of at the forefront. That doesn't mean we're doing enough or we're there, but at least we have started early on to kind of, let's not say get the right structures, but to incentivize work in that area. So there are researchers in the lab here, also in New York, who, for example, think about uh, um, uh, using AI in the, in the justice system, and we know there are many bad situations where there are studies that kind of huge bias in the decision whether somebody should go out on parole or should uh, um, 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 should be granted certain rights and so we I think we are kind of the the good thing is at Microsoft we are we are incentivized to think along those lines that doesn't mean we're doing well <laughs> it just means that the company appreciates it and I think this is also something that is I like a lot about um, working in a company then versus academia. In academia, it was very difficult to kind of get out of your box. Uh, I was a database person. I got database grants. I got students. The best students of the world came to me because they wanted to do databases. But then they came, and they were amazing students. And I said, OK, do you want to do a little bit more than databases? No, no, I want to do databases, because then I can be, become a professor at, at MIT or so. <laughs> One of my students is a <laughs> professor at MIT, so that's why I can say that. Um, and uh, because they wanted to focus. It's very difficult to do, actually do that. And, and all universities are trying to do that with interdisciplinary centers. Maybe data science is now an opportunity. In a company, it's much more agile. Right? The, the leadership says, we are we are giving you kind of credit, kind of we're incentivizing that to work on that, and then things will happen a little bit more. Um, and of course, but we are all humans, right? <laughs> Changing is, is difficult. Okay, does that kind of answer your question? There's a question over there. Thanks. Um, I I appreciate the, like, we are incentivized to think about it here. Like, I spent my summer in New York working with the FATE team on, like, the ethical implications of technology. But at the same time, like, while I was there, Brad Smith came out and said that not only was he comfortable, like, selling artificial intelligence technology to the U.S. military, he felt it was his patriotic duty to make sure that we are better, the United States, at blowing people up with robots than any other country in the world. Um, I'm curious as to how being incentivized to think about the social implications of our work, like works with a CEO who believes that like it is the duty of Microsoft to make sure that people are killed in the most efficient way possible. 
Uh, okay, so first of all, I don't. So first of all, Brad Smith is not the CEO, but anyway, he's the president. He's uh, uh, I, and I don't know that quote, but uh, so let let me just try to. So we live in a democracy. Um, ultimately, m most of the big decisions decisions about our society are not made by Brad Smith or Satya Nadella or or us. We Microsoft plays a particular role. And the, the role that Microsoft plays is kind of working towards its strength, developing technology, but how the technology is used is ultimately the decision of the, the political system and of our society. Now, I'm not going to... These are, these are now political discuss, discussions, and, if, and Brad Smith has his right to his political opinion. I have my own personal political opinions. But if you think about a company of of, um, of 100,000, more than 100,000 people, you will find all sorts of political opinions. Now, what holds Microsoft together is clearly not, we want the US to be the best to blow up people. That's not what holds this company together. What holds this company together is the mission of the company, and that's very clearly defined as uh, empowering people and uh, organizations to achieve more, and all around the world. Now, you can, can interpret that as achieving more and blowing up people, but that's not how we usually interpret it. Yeah? So what I'm trying to say is that there's going to be a lot of polit political opinions uh, among people, but this is not the, the fabric of Microsoft. I think it, when he says something like that, he will say that as Brad Smith, and he will not say that as Microsoft. Now, how Microsoft makes decisions ultimately um, in, uh, in, in selling technology to the, to the military, it will do that according to its mission. And of course, yeah, we, we are a US company, and I think um, we, we are committed to, uh, to, to uh, operating in the US and, and serving, um, among others, the US, but also other countries. Hi. Uh, so I was just mulling on the whole idea of making the world a better place by computers. And I come from India, and it, it's very diverse in the sense of how people use computers. And uh, what I've seen in my research in government is that a lot of people, I mean, it creates like a caste system in terms of how some people are, are good at using computers. They have always used computers. And then there's this older staff who has never used it. And, and maybe they're asked to retire early because they can't use computers. So, you know, how could a company like Microsoft, I mean, you know, just like remove the blinkers of only computers can make the world a better place. No. <laughs> and, and, you know, think about maybe, maybe different things. I mean, just a, something I'm thinking about. Yeah. Yeah, so I, there's actually an interesting project in, um, in India from Microsoft Research, which is called 99 Dots. I don't know whether you've heard of it. It is essentially, I think it's mostly for diabetes patients to make sure that, um, that they take their medication. Yeah. yeah. Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. Oh, tuberculosis. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Tuberculosis. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, it turns out that initially they started with a lot of computers and technology. At the end, the technology is essentially paper-based, right? Because that worked much better, because that's where you have the tactile experience, and it has small telephone numbers and so on. It's actually very, very low tech. Of course, we often think, and we are often in this trap, uh, automating, computing, digital, everything. Uh, but yes, you're right. We have, to, uh, we have to be grounded in our baseline. <laughs> our baseline is not, um, what is the best way to do it with computers? Our baseline is what is the best way to do it, full stop, right? And I think, yeah, that's a big trap that we have to be careful about falling in. Hi. Um, that was a great talk. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Um, let's say I'm a Microsoft researcher and I have an idea for a product or a platform. Is there an established process to explore it and develop it? Yeah, that's actually a great question, and uh, um, the answer is yes and no. 
So there are, in some ways, there are kind of ways and paths how to get there. But really it is no. If you want to be really honest and you have something really new, this is what I call creating new business, the answer is no. And I would kind of argue, I, I will give you an, alt, an equivalent thought process for the, for the real world that's outside of Microsoft. Let's say, I don't know whether you're a, which university you're from, but the Silicon Valley, kind of the startup scene, you, you could ask, is there an established process for a startup to become successful? Yeah? And you would say yes and no. Yes is, well, you get some seed funding, you get Series A funding, <laughs> Series B funding. At some point, you do an IPO or you kind of uh, sell your company to, to some other company and get there. Um, this is kind of like what we could have here as well. You get asked for seed funding and so on, and you get that in some, uh, here as well. But then if you really go to the bottom of it, changing the world is really, really hard, right? And there's no established process for doing that. Yeah, there are books written about it, right, uh, how to do that. But essentially, there's no established process. You have to kind of, the, the established process, and this is why I believe that MSI is such a good place, is I would call it navigating uncertainty, right? We, when, we, when we innovate, we walk on a minefield, and we kind of go like that yeah, and, and make sure that we, and things change all the time, right? We are making assumptions, we are creating hypotheses. And this is why I think the scientific approach and why I strongly believe in Microsoft research of changing the world is the right one, because it is based on making hypotheses, validating them, pivoting, um, and learning while you go. And uh, this is not an established process, but it is a mindset, and it's a mindset uh, that you actually all are getting as part of your um, education as PhD students. That's why we care so much about you finishing your PhDs. We would love to hire you immediately, right? But no, we are not doing that because we want you to kind of uh, um, get this mindset. Yeah? I hope that that answers somewhat the, the question, but in the yes and no way. <laughs> Donald, I want to make you aware of the time. Yeah. If you okay. want to answer one more question or, or were you okay? No, I'm, I'm happy to answer one more question. My Fantastic. next meeting is with my boss, so okay. any so, minute I miss with that <laughs> is great. It's highly appreciated. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. You as a supercomputer guy, what do you think about uh, your colleagues that are working towards quantum computing? Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, yeah, so first of all, I, I know them and they're I have a huge amount of respect. I mean, this is kind of thinking really, really big. Um, I, I mean, Google just uh, announced a breakthrough. I, I think still in the, in, the, in the category that they can do something that we cannot do before, they're not there yet, right? Everything that they can do now is. So what I really, what impresses me is, um, is one of the things that if you have these big goals, let's say moonshot. This is a moonshot in our terminology. What, is, what was great about the moonshot was all the great technologies that we developed. Uh, so my frying pan wouldn't exist without the moonshot. And we, had, we are seeing the same thing with the quantum computing research, like uh, a very low temperature computing. It might not be the quantum computer, but actually it's a very great way to do computing. The algorithms, thinking about a quantum algorithm, we, we're seeing uh, we have this Q-sharp language, and we're seeing that we, the, the, the programs we write in Q-sharp are actually beating on a conventional computer our normal programs just because they were written thinking about a quantum computer. And that's what I, I, think, I find exciting about it. I don't know where it is going, but uh, uh, we'll see. Uh, I, I hope that it's, uh, I, I hope it will be successful because there are some really great applications. So battery is one of them. So if we can develop like a huge breakthrough in battery technology, which apparently can only be done with a quantum computer, I'll take it. <laughs> All right, let's thanks Donald for okay, giving us Okay, thank you speech. very much.